All right, we got about two minutes before we are going to get things underway for this week. Thank you to those of you who are patiently waiting, getting on nice and early. KP Vols, what's going on? If that KP Vols means you're a Vols fan, I feel bad for you this weekend. That was a tough one. We got Sierra checking in. What's going on? We got Sleepy Condor. We got Steve. What's going on? What's going on? There we go. KP Vols is KP from the chat. Well, welcome to the stream. We've got 40 seconds until go time. Here we go. We had KP, now we got KB. Let's go. Two seconds, one second. That is the timer. Let's get it going. Let me get rid of the notifications. More for what's going on. Uh, thank you to everyone who has tuned in for another edition of our weekly stock market scan. Last week, uh, it was a really good one for us. I mean, you know, we didn't completely blow everything out of the water profit wise, but we had a 1.12% return. That's 1,937 bucks. John O, what's going on? And uh, we outperformed the S&P 500 by 1.39% as the S&P 500 lost 0.27%. So, you know, objectively from the top, anything above a 1% return in a week is really, really good. So we had a really, really good week. Uh, outside of that, to make that kind of return in a week when the S&P 500 went down is even better. So we were super happy about the way that all turned out. Let's quickly talk about how we did it. Uh, UWMC, they had earnings. It went up. It went back down. I think it's hanging out right around 7 bucks a share right now. Which, but uh, with that earnings event being behind us, we lost a little bit of premium on that. So we made 500 bucks. Rocket Lab uh, just keeps slipping away bit by bit. We picked up 300 bucks there. BRPM, hopefully what we are thinking is going to be something of a sleeping giant. We're waiting on that one to hopefully run at some point in the next couple of months. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. No uh, no harm, no foul there. There's really limited downside on those shares. FFIE, we entered into a 7.9 or 7.5 and 9 strike debit spread because we thought it was going to go down. But uh, it didn't go down. We had a week till expiry, but instead of risking some sort of max loss, we just decided to pull the money out. We were having a good week so far. We didn't want to have anything crush us. So that was the decision that we made right there. If you're still in on those, I don't think they're a bad trade. And I think it could work out. We just didn't want to run it right down to the uh, right down to the final week there. SPIR was an interesting one. We could pull the chart up here to kind of demonstrate why that is. If we go SPIR, uh, they had earnings as well. If we go to the five-day chart, it'll be a little bit more clear to see because uh, anything above five is max profit for us. But as you can see, right after they announced their earnings, it dropped down to 482, which was a little bit scary for a brief period of time on a Wednesday afternoon. But come Thursday morning, it shot all the way up to almost six bucks a share, back down. And then by Friday, it leveled pretty much dead off at 530, which is really, really interesting price action for you know how volatile this thing typically is. It didn't really move too far outside of a one or two cent range for the majority of Friday. So that's Interesting, and we'll see how it finishes up next week. But the good news is, uh, you know, that monthly option expiry is coming up. We'll talk about that in a minute, but moving down the list here, XCLA, VISL, IGC, all super similar trades. Those are kind of hanging out around their break-even prices. I think IGC got back near the max profit point, uh, but, you know, 
bled some premium out on a couple of these. I think overall on these three, yeah, there we go. We made money. We made 200 and, excuse me, made 210 bucks on that one. So can't be too upset with that. And then our SPX hedges, uh, we had to get out of the first one for a loss because the market was running away from us a little bit on Monday. But we rolled up, we rolled out, and that's kind of how you play defense with spreads like this when it uh, when it goes against you. We pulled 210 bucks of profit from those spreads. RTPY slash AUR, that was one that was a SPAC. Then it merged, and we were playing that volatility event, hoping that the premium would be sucked out of those options. And that one played out pretty nicely for us. We made 120 bucks. We didn't really care to take it down to expiry next week, so we took our money and we ran. DM, we are going to be taking to expiry. CBAT, CRSP, we're taking those three to expiry. Uh, Palantir is one, really our only big loser on the week if you take a look in the context of the trades that we made, right? The strategy that we go for every week is we're trying to hit a bunch of, you know, base hits, load the bases, score some runs. We're not trying to hit a grand slam. We're not trying to knock it out of the park. But if we keep stacking up successful trade after successful trade, uh, we're going to have a successful week. And that's exactly what we accomplished, right? We had, let's see, we had 24 different trades here and only one, two, three for five of them lost money for us on the week and i say five because these two were spx and they netted out to a gain uh, but that's kind of the strategy that's our approach we are losing right now on this one but what are we going to do about it the answer is we're going to enter into a covered strangle if you aren't familiar with what a covered strangle is we've got a video about it on our youtube channel uh, that you could take a look at and it has uh, information about entering into that covered strangle as part of our hd will strategy but for those of you who are watching right now a quick high level overview is normally when you run the wheel, you sell puts. If it goes down, you're gonna take assignment of the shares. Uh, and then if you know, you're know you running the typical wheel, you're gonna sell covered calls. But what we also do with the HT wheel is what's called a covered strangle. So in addition to these covered calls that you're selling, you're also gonna be selling some cash secured puts to further lower your basis. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with Palantir, the idea was that we started trading it when it was at 24.8 after a pretty big drop after earnings. We could pull that chart up really quickly. There you go. Here's this big earnings drop, and it's a setup that we've been playing uh, on a lot of stocks that had drop-offs post-earnings. We got in right around this level after the first candle. We could have been a little bit more patient, uh, and we kind of got burned a little bit because we weren't super patient, but the idea is we got in around here uh, on a trade with the break-even price right around here. And for the first day or so, you know, it held above that level, but the second day, Wednesday after earnings, uh, really dropped off, bouncing off 22. But if we zoom back out on the chart here, We've got several ranges of support, you know, 21, 22 being a couple of the most prominent that we've identified. So we're happy to pick Palantir up and start playing it in this range because, you know, over the past 180 days, with the exception of when it had a really rough uh, stretch back in May and it bounced off of 16 pretty sharply, might I mention, uh, it's been trading in this 28 to 22 range, which is really nice because it's volatile within the range, which creates premium on the options. But again, it stays within that range, which allows us the time to lower our break-even price and continue to run the HT wheel. So that's what we've done, right? We initially had a break-even price of 23.75 because we sold these 24 strike puts for 25 cents a piece. And then we took assignment. We did it with what is called manual assignment. And the idea is that if we didn't do anything on Friday, we would have been assigned these and we would have held a hundred, excuse me, would have held a thousand shares over the weekend without any options to cover them, which is a little bit risky, right? Because if the stock drops, we're not going to have any protection. So what we did was we, you know, quote unquote, what we call manually assigned the shares. So we bought back the puts for a loss and then we bought shares at market price. Now this pretty much has the same exact effect of uh, getting assigned. And the reason is the loss flows through the puts instead of flowing through the shares, which would have been assigned at 24, right? If these were assigned at 24, we would have had a roughly 1170 loss, you know, netted against whatever premium we had up here on the 25. And it comes out to roughly the same number, if that makes sense. But the idea is we manually assigned ourselves those shares. That way we can sell the covered calls, which lower our break even price by 19 cents. And then additionally, sell the 22 strike cash secured puts at a one-to-one -one ratio meaning we sold 10 covered calls so we're going to sell 10 cash secured puts and that means that this 24 cents of premium that we got on these 22 strike puts that we sold is also going to be a cent for cent reduction of our break-even price so we got in on the trade on november the 9th uh, with a break-even price of 23.75 and now after just one week of running this our break-even price is now down to 23.32 so that if you go to the i guess 10 day chart here 23.32 let's take some of these lines off right here we started 2375 2332 
uh, is now our new break even price so we're moving the target down and if it bounces back up to 24 we're going to get all this uh we're going to get all of the stock gain back right if the thing pops back up to 24 we're going to get all this stock gain back uh, so we get 1200 bucks off the shares which easily covers that loss from the cash geared puts and in addition uh, we get the premium from the 24 call and the 22 strike put that we sold it'll be a 680 gain which analyzes to a really nice number after uh you know the duration of this trade that we've been in on so that's the idea there you know we could have sold a 23 strike call to get some more premium and lower our break even price further but i'm really confident with palantir around the 22 23 level so i'm happy to leave myself a little bit more upside uh, up to that 24 strike right there so that was the idea with that we're going to be rolling that trade into next week you'll see it when we scroll down here a little bit later and talk about what we've got lined up for next week but that was kind of the only trade that we had in play last week that required a little bit of position management and this is a good example because you know a lot of these trades do work out for us right we only had five of these that ended up in the red if you look at last week we really only had two that ended up in the red you know the week before that wasn't the greatest week, but we still made money overall. But, you know, you get the idea if you scroll up and look a little bit further back in our trading history, right? We're, we're hitting these at a very high rate of success. So the idea is to minimize the amount of losers that we have. And this strategy we had with manually signing the shares, entering into that covered strangle as a part of the HT wheel, and lowering our break-even price from here to here is how we're going to try to accomplish that goal. So uh, and the question from Todd in the YouTube chat, if Palantir continues to drop, uh, you will get another a thousand shares assigned and that's correct and this calculation that we have right here is just if it doesn't get back down to 22 our break even is 2332 what's interesting though if i pull up the handy dandy actually i could probably just do this on the screen right here we have this first set of shares at 2278 right and then we sold 24 strike calls so really the basis that we have on this first set of shares is going to be 22 point or excuse me, it's really going to be 2375 because that was our break even price on the push that they were from. And uh, let's see right here, minus 19 cents of premium. So this is our basis on this first set of shares, right? That's with that premium from the 24 strike put and the premium from the covered calls considered. But with this potential second set of 1000 shares, if assigned on those, our break even price would be 22 minus the point to four of premium that we got on this put so it would actually be 2176 and the average of these two if we go down here is actually 2266 so the idea is that you know this break-even price that we have right here is what happens if this expires worthless and we'll just continue to enter into that coverage strangle week after week until the shares get called away but if Palantir does go down further and we're signed another 1,000 shares, the way the math works out is our new stock break-even price is actually even lower because we get these new shares added into the equation at a lower average cost. So then if we're assigned, our break-even is going to be 2266, which is actually all the way down here. So that is what we have set up. This is our current break-even price. Our potential break-even price if assigned is even lower. And that's why we like the covered strangles because it gets us... You know, we already set the bar pretty low with the 24 strike push that we sold off the bat. Entering into the covered strangle moved it down here. And if things really keep moving against us and we get assigned an additional lot of shares, that break even price automatically by the end of the week is going to move even further down and then we can manage it from there. And then KB in the YouTube chat asking, if we didn't get a chance to enter the strangle on Friday, would you suggest selling puts on Monday and writing the covered calls on Monday? Absolutely. If you are in the trade right now and you basically just have shares that are sitting there uncovered in both directions uh, i think monday morning is a good time to uh good time to enter into that and try to protect the trade manage that break even price and accept the fact that you know we're going to win a lot of our trades but it's important not to try to turn you know losing trades into these big winners what we want to do with the losing trades is manage them and get them to a point where we could potentially break even or pull or pull a little bit of profit right because if we never lose we win and that is the uh, that's the idea we're moving forward here with. So that's what we're doing with Palantir. Uh, moving down the list. Speaking of those post earnings dips that we were you know targeting, Peloton was a good one. Uh, we made a little bit of money off that. Paysafe was a good one as well. And I can pull these charts up as well to show you these setups that we're going for. 
Peloton, really big drop off, but eventually, you know, levels out and implied volatility levels back out as well, which kills the premiums. Pay safe, really big drop, but it levels out. We sold the four strike put, was never really in danger as of end of day Thursday or any point during the day on Friday. That was a quick 100 bucks, but that's the idea that we were going for, and we, we have pursued successfully in the past, but every now and then they're going to keep dipping, so nothing to worry about too much there. I think we had Beyond this week, BYND, there you go, the 70 strike put also a really similar idea this is a really common uh, chart shape after a really big drop post earnings just a either a leveling out or a quick rebound which we sold 70 strike puts all the way down here and we're able to get a really solid return on those in just a one or two day period so that's something we're going to keep going to the well time and time again for if it doesn't work it doesn't work like with palantir but you know, using the HT wheel, entering into that coverage strangle. It's important that we have these techniques to help us manage the losing trades. And that is how we're going to keep coming out on top in the long run. So just be patient with it. It's It's been less than a week with Palantir. We'll see where we are at come, uh, come Friday afternoon. I'm hoping we are above 23 at the very least, but we'll see. And then Todd, another question was wondering when you stop trying to get shares so your size isn't too big if it keeps dropping. And that's a great point about position sizing, right? So with the HT wheel, I don't have the diagram in front of me, but I could pull it up really quickly if I pop into our Discord here. One second. If we go into the pinned messages, you guys can find this right here. But there you go. This might be a little bit small on the screen, but the idea as we go step by step by step, and right now we're on step two, right? We manually signed our shares. We sold covered calls above our cost basis and sold puts one to two strikes below the current price. <clears throat> Excuse me. And our position sizing is out here to the right. And off the bat, you want to put about 50 to 75% of the collateral that you intend to invest overall, right? Because when you sell these cash secured puts as part of the HT wheel, you're increasing your position size. So we don't want to allocate 100% of the position off the bat because then if it moves against us the way Palantir did, we don't really have a way to play defense. And that's something that's so, so, so important in the context of this strategy because, you know, stocks aren't going to go down forever. They're not going to have red week after red week after red week. I mean, sure, there could be a lot of red weeks in a row for a stock, don't get me wrong. But the idea is that the concept of mean reversion is one that definitely plays out uh, pretty frequently in the stock market. So if it keeps dropping, eventually there's going to be some sort of, you know, buying volume, some sort of balance, or at least leveling out. So that we can, you know, manage that basis and get the trade profit and loss looking a little bit better than what it did off the bat. And then we're not to step three yet, but step three is kind of optional. You could consider adding a little bit more depending on how confident you feel in the stock going forward. Uh, I really recommend not going, you know, beyond 125 to 150 percent of what you originally intended to invest. And then if you get to point, you know, step four down here, and it still keeps moving against you. This is when you really want to think about if you should cut the trade loose or not because it's clearly not working at that point. We don't want to keep throwing money uh, you know, in the fire pit, so to speak. Uh, so it's important come step three and four to take a step back, see if it's still working. And I think the best question to ask yourself uh, when a trade is moving against you is if you had no money in the market and had to invest tomorrow, is that trade something that you would enter into? And if the answer is no, there's really no reason to stay in that trade. You know, you fall into a little bit of a sunk cost fallacy. But yeah, that's Palantir. That's the HT wheel process. We've got videos about how that process works up on our YouTube channel. And that is the approach that we're taking to manage that trade. Uh, nothing else too interesting, I think, to talk about on here. Uh, Zillow was another one, that 55 strike put. It's going to look very familiar, right? Big drop off post earnings, levels out, make money off the decline in premium as it levels out. And I think a good way to visualize this is pulling up that implied volatility study. There you go. And you can see after the earnings, the implied volatility just continues to drop and drop and drop after, uh, whatchamacallit, after the earnings and as the stock levels off and that drop in implied volatility results in a drop in option premium, which results in an increase in our profits. All right. And as Sleepy Condor has pointed out in the Twitch chat, you don't always have to strangle one-to-one. -one. Off the bat, I do like to strangle one-to-one -one because that means you know, every cent of premium that you get on those cash-secured puts that you sell is a direct reduction to your cost basis. But you know, as far as how comfortable of a position size or how big of a position size that you're comfortable with, you know, a one-to-one -one strangle or even going beyond that might not be something that you're good with. And it's you know, above all else, it's most important 
uh, to enter trades that you're comfortable in. If you're a little bit uneasy about the amount of money that you have in a trade, you know, just take a step back, take the foot off the gas. There's no need to keep piling in because getting into uncomfortable position sizes can lead to uncomfortable losses. That can lead to an emotional trading and emotional trading could lead to big losses. We don't want to have big losses. But I think that pretty much is all we've got for the past week. Nothing too crazy. We will talk about, uh, let's talk about Newegg really quickly before we go into what we've got for the upcoming week. This is one of those IV reversion trades that we love so much. We were able to sell 11.5 strike puts on Newegg, N-E-G-G. There you have it, right? We, we had what we were looking for for the most part on an IV reversion trade. We had a little bit of an identifiable base right here at around 12 bucks a share-ish. It did hit a low of 11.55, so we did sell the 11.5 strike puts for that reason. But you could see it pretty clearly in front of us on this chart. Really big green candle that increased implied volatility. As implied volatility goes up, the option premium goes up. And as the stock comes back down and levels off, uh, you know, it could remain volatile in its drop, but typically as the stock drops, implied volatility also drops, which knocks the premium on those options back. Down. Now, we're not going to be able to see the 11.12 puts that we sold, uh, but you probably should be able to see pretty similar price action in what's going for 11.19 right here. So if we pull up the chart, more info, TOS charts, go to the 10-day, maybe the 20-day. There you have it, right? So you had these these 11.5 uh, strike puts that were trading for 70 cents uh, 70 cents ish around the time of the spike and you can see the spike modeled by the theoretical option price right because as a price of a stock goes up the price of a put option should go down it should go down however when implied volatility jumps up as much as it does as we just saw on that chart they aren't going to lose value as quickly as they normally would. So you take advantage of that spike in implied volatility, even if it drops a little bit, right, from 70 to 60, not a huge deal. You get in at that 60 level, and then over the next couple days, as implied volatility levels back out, that premium gets absolutely sucked out, and you're looking at a one, two, three, four, five-day period here where you could have sold these for 60-ish cents a piece on the spike, and then five days after that, they were trading at about 12 cents a piece. So you would be looking at about 80 or 90% of max profit there in a pretty short time frame. But that's the idea that we're targeting with that IV reversion type trade. And it worked out pretty nicely for us. We were able to scoop up a quick $150 on that one. But there you go. All in all, $1,937 of profit last week, 1.12% return. And we outperformed by 1.39%. And if you take a look at our year-to-date summary tab over here really quickly before moving forward, that takes us up to a $5,516 return so far in November. That's 3.25% compared to a 0.98% return in October for the S&P 500. So we're happy to see that uh, going down. We have really only had two losing weeks uh, since mid-July right here. We've got, what, 17 weeks right here, 15 of these last 17 weeks. We have made money, which really speaks to the consistency of our strategy because as you could see here you know over the last 17 weeks the s p 500 definitely has not gone up uh every single week so we're super happy about that uh, that takes us up overall to a 103.54 percent return on the year we are above our target that we set for ourselves of a 100 percent return year to date we still have a month and a half to go and we are going to try to finish out strong so how are we going to do that let's get into it let's talk about what we have for the upcoming week and before we get into it really quick. Self promo here, some shameless self promotion for HD Premium. If you go to hourglass trader.com, go to join HD Premium, you can join our premium offering, right? It's always going to be free to come join us on the streams. It's always going to be free to come in our Discord server, uh, talk in the main chat room, talk about the strategies, uh, and learn what we do. It's always going to be free to learn. But if you do want to add a little bit extra to your trading, uh, you could definitely do that with our HD Premium program. There is a. Uh, there's a one-week free trial if you sign up for monthly, but you could also get a free month if you sign up for a Webull account using our referral link that we have here in the Discord server. But the general idea, you're getting access to our premium chat room. Uh, you're getting alerts for every single trade as we open, as we close, and you're going to have these, you know, you get tagged as an HD Premium member. So if you have alerts on for Discord, they'll come to your phone. No different than a text message. Great for people that are busy and don't want to stay just glued to the screens. If you got an alert coming in, you could follow us on the trade uh, and 
pretty much recreate exactly what we're doing in here. We've also got some new channels in here for uh, some different trading strategies that have been going really well. We have trade plans every now and then for some uh, more involved type trades. We have watch lists that we use and the option scanners that we use to uh, come up with our trades. And again, you can sign up for that on hourglass-trader.com going to uh, that join HG premium link right there. And there we go. Appreciate that sleepy condor saying it's worth every penny. And he is a member of our $100,000 profit club, which we've got right here. So, uh, you know, I, I would take his word for it. But back to our regularly scheduled programming. What do we have for the upcoming week? This is it. And again, we always start with a pretty short list for the upcoming week. As you can see by what we've got tagged here in column G, we always add a lot of new trades as the week progresses because, you know, there are some decent setups that we could aim to target on, a, on Sunday nights, but things move so quickly on a day-to-day -day basis, which is another reason why those, uh, why being a member of a, you know, community like what we've built with our Discord server and having those trade alerts uh, it can be super, super helpful on a day-to-day -day basis. We got a question saying, how much is premium? It is $25 a month, so less than a dollar a day. Or you could sign up for $225 a year, which uh, when you you know extrapolate that 12, that $25 bucks out over 12 months, $225 a year gives you a 25% discount if you're going to be in it for the uh, for the long haul. And you know pretty much all these trades we're making, $100, $200, $300, bucks, it, I think it will pay for itself pretty quickly if you are... Uh, if you are replicating what we're doing in there and following along with the discussion, I think a lot of people who are signed up for it can speak to that as well. Uh, but with 1119 coming up this Friday, it is our favorite week of the month, and that is the monthly option expiry week. Why do we love that so much? I guess we could tab back to our year-to-date summary. All these weeks that are highlighted green right here are the year, or excuse me, are the monthly option expiry weeks. So if we quickly add these up, we had a little bit of a loss there in April. Whoops. Uh, if we add up how we've performed on those weeks so far this year, we have actually made, let's see, $18,000 just on those weeks alone. And that's seven different weeks. So we've we've got a really decent track record on these. And, and why is that? It's because a lot of these options that we play, they don't have weekly option expiries. They have monthly expiries. So we have a lot of smaller stocks that typically carry a little bit more implied volatility, a little bit more premium that are going to be expiring uh, this Friday and SPIR, XCLA, IGC, VISL, DM, you know, CBAT, those are all examples of stocks that fall into that category. And if they pretty much stay where they are for the most part, we're going to be collecting a decent chunk of premium this week. So there we go. We've got Sierra saying she paid for three years of premium just this week. So, uh, you know, that is about as well as I could put it. I will let the group speak for itself. There we go. So we have a question, and this is a good question too from, from Harsi. Oh boy, <laughs> Harsi Emran 3865. You're gonna have to forgive me in advance for uh, for completely butchering the pronunciation of your username. I know there's like a 15 second delay on your stream uh, from when you guys are watching me. So as I'm saying this, I'm not gonna be able to hear you make fun of me for messing that up. But the question is, how come our cost for Palantir is 2278? And this is the answer, right? So there's two different ways we can look at this, right? We lost $920 right here uh, on these two trades. We could either look at it by saying, hey, we took the loss up front on the 24 strike puts and then we picked up the shares at 2278. Or alternatively, you know, we could say that we had all that premium cleaned out, but we had a 24 basis and the loss flowed through there. So there you go, a $920 loss. It's pretty much the same net effect. And that's why we use that manual assignment strategy. But let's put these back the way they were. And since we closed these out for a loss, that's 970. This is all just part of the same trade. So as we net these things against each other, the basis is still all going to work the same. It's just that when we use manual assignment, the loss flows through the options that we closed for a loss, as opposed to the shares that we normally would have taken assignment for 24. Uh, but they're now we got those at market price for 2278 after taking the loss on the 24 strike put. So hopefully that answers your question right there. Uh, and also include your coverage sharing. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I think that should have answered the question. If not, let me know. I could pop back to it. But that's what we've got for the upcoming week. That's the price that we picked those shares at. And you can see that loss that we picked up on the options reflected in last week's profit or loss. Uh, but at the top of the week, I think this is something I always recommend and I always do as a quick exercise to evaluate how good of a position you're in for the upcoming week is to evaluate what your week would look like if prices of stocks didn't move at all because you know things can go up they could help us things could go down they could hurt us 
but I think the most likely price for a stock to be at five days from now is the same price that it's at today. So we can just use the weekly, or I guess the ones that are expiring this Friday as a starter. SPIR, that one would expire worthless. XELA, I think this would expire and be about 40 cents. IGC is a max profit. Visilink's at about a buck 80, so this would go down to 0.2. DM would be max profit. Palantir, these would expire worthless. CBAT, I think this would be about 25 ish. And then CRISPR would also expire worthless. So there you have it just from the options that are expiring this Friday. We're in position for about a $3,000 return. And that's ignoring if, you know, BRPM makes a run, if UWMC loses another $0.05 cents a premium, and then Rocket Lab loses another $0.05 cents a premium. We, you know, we're moving towards a $4,000 return. And that's before we've even layered in any of the upcoming trades that we'll probably make this week. So at a high level, looking at what I have for the upcoming week, I'm very happy with how it sets up. I think we're in a position to collect a lot of premium uh, over the next five days. So I'm not looking to do a ton on Monday morning. And the reason behind that as well is if we look over here when we label out our, you know, the amount of buying power that we're using, right? Our strategy that we switched up, if you look at our returns from July moving forward, uh, from January to June, I admittedly used a little bit too much buying power. I used some leverage. I got in a little bit over my head. And while it had some great weeks where we made, you know, $15,000, $14,000, $16,000, we also had our fair share of weeks that were not so great. As you see these uh, see these pretty big pullbacks on the chart for our account balance, you know, we lost 15 grand in a week, six grand, nine grand, seven grand. And while we did overall turn out okay, right? We haven't lost money a single month on the year yet so far with this strategy. You know, mentally it was a little bit too much of a heart attack for me. So we've adjusted our strategy a little bit to be a little bit lower stress, which is using less buying power and that affords us flexibility on the losing trade so that you know, we're not going to have these big $14,000, $16,000 weeks anymore going forward. But, you know, the price action on our account balance is looking a lot better, in my opinion, from July going forward than how it did uh, from January to July when we decided to switch it up. So that's the idea with what we've got going right now. You know, we're only using 46% of our buying power. So if something does come across and falls into our lap, something like, you know, a new egg or a beyond type trade where you know, it can't miss, we've got to use it because it looks like really easy money we have the freedom to do so. But at the same time, we know that if we were fully assigned on every single position we hold, we'd be using over 100% of our buying power, right? 128% of our buying power. And, you know, sometimes that's okay, right? We like to analyze what is actually taking up that buying power. We've got things like UWMC, Rocket Lab, which take up, you know, 98,000 of the total, what? 225,000. So just over a third of the buying power is tied up in these two, which pretty much don't have a chance of being assigned at any point in the near term. So we're not too worried about that. So, you know, high level for our positions that are a little bit, a little bit more volatile. Uh, we have a decent amount of buying power in play, but I'm not, I'm not, you know, there's no gun to my head forcing me to make more trades. I want to sit back. I don't want to trade just to trade. Now I'm sure we'll find some good setups tonight, but I, I don't want to trade just to trade to repeat that because I'd so much rather miss out on a good trade than be stuck in a bad trade just because I felt like I was forced to make that trade. Uh, but that's the idea that we have heading into the week. And I'm sure, you know, I, I kind of give that little spiel at the beginning of every single week. And then I end up making tons of new trades, as you can see by the history in our profit tracker. But that's kind of what we've got set up for the upcoming week. Uh, and I think, you know, when we did that quick exercise of seeing what that premium would look like, uh, come Friday if the prices didn't move. I'm really happy with where we sit. And I think all of these that we have highlighted here in blue and the blue highlights indicate that they expire this week. I think anything that we have highlighted in blue is a pretty good entry as it stands right now with the exception of maybe XELA, CBAT, and I think Vizilink's still okay, but CBAT, XELA, I don't know if I would enter into those, but everything else I think is offering some solid weekly premium and I'm happy to stay in it. But now that begs the question, what's going on for the upcoming week? Let's uh, let's take a look. And the first place that we start off when we do this is going to be with our scanner. And again, a little plug for HD Premium. You can get all these preset scanners that we use. Uh, the links to those are on our website when you sign up. So we've got high return puts without earnings. So we like to isolate earnings because, you know, earnings are kind of their own monster. They carry their own premiums. And... Uh, they could really mess up the results of the scan. It's annoying to see that something is offering a really nice return on a week, looking into it and saying, oh, shoot, they've got earnings, never mind. But let's run this scan. It's going to give us 
out of the money puts, which is one is important because, you know, we mentioned that the most likely price for a stock to be at is exactly what it's trading at right now. So if we sell puts that are out of the money, you know, 100% of the value of the put that we sell is going to be extrinsic in nature, and it's going to decay if the stock doesn't move. So we've got GWH, and I could already strike a few of these down because we're familiar with what these are, because on a week to week basis, we see a lot of the same names. Uh, GWH, I'm not a big fan of because it's a former special purpose acquisition company with a net asset value of about 10 bucks a share, uh, meaning that it's definitely liable to go down to or even below 10 bucks a share at some point here in the near future. So I wouldn't want to own it with a 15 basis. Uh, AGC, I th think it's kind of similar. I do see it mentioned a decent amount on social media, but there you have it, right? It's run up from 10, definitely liable to, uh, to fall back down there. You've got that $10 price floor. Growth Corp, it looks like a SPAC. Now, implied volatility is high because it's through the roof, right? But if you want to look back at the base, you know, you don't see any premium at all at 10 near that base. And there's a re the reason for that is because, you know, it's probably not going to get back down there. That's the price floor. But if we can't get any premium on the, on the price floor, you know, we don't really want to sell those options. So back to the scan. PHUN, I think this is one that moved in sympathy with DWAC. And yeah, this is 100% the setup that we try to ignore, right? Uh, it was trading at about $1 a share before shooting up to 24. And while implied volatility is still pretty high from this big spike, it's nowhere near as high as it used to be. I think these options might be relatively newer, right? And if we wanted to sell puts on an IV reversion type trade, remember that we would want to sell them around the original base. That original base is around $1 a share. If we go to the option chain, you know, there's no premium on a dollar a share pretty much anywhere in the near term unless you want to go out to march and get you know 10 to 15 cents on one of these things but i wouldn't want to be holding that stock for too long so that's another one that shows up on the scanner because it has a lot of premium but from an investment standpoint not the greatest idea in the world new egg we know from what we talked about earlier in the night that the base on that one's at around 11 50 or 12 bucks a share wouldn't want to own it at 15.5 dwac another crazy one dwh again uh, I'm staying away from the miners, right? So Mara, BTBT, I'm not a big fan of those either right now because I think you know crypto is a little bit running running a little bit too hot right now. So I'm not the biggest fan of the world. Next thing that sticks out to me right here is going to be the CRVS four strike put. And a lot of the time, I like the smaller puts because you know while it fundamentally isn't true that a stock is cheaper if you know the number for the price of the stock is lower. You know, fundamentally, from a psychological trading perspective, people seem to put value in cheaper stocks. So something like a four strike put might be a little safer than selling like a 58 strike put for just that psychological reason. And I know that's not based in numbers, but I've seen that play out far too often to ignore the impact. But let's take a look at CRVS because that's an interesting looking one. Okay, not surprising, it's a pharmaceutical company, and we do like to try to avoid pharmaceutical companies with this strategy, and there you go. Reason being is that they're just far too volatile, potentially, to the downside. If they have upcoming news, upcoming trial results, anything like that, uh, these really big drops can outpace your basis way faster than you can lower it with our strategy. So these pharmaceutical-type companies are not the greatest to try and uh, try and trade. And remember, you know, we try to look at that base. That base is around two bucks a share. We go to the two strike. Really nothing happening on that two strike, especially for the upcoming option expiry on November 19th. So we go back to the scan and keep moving down. Uh, WIMI, another interesting one. Let's take a look at that. I have no idea what it is, but we are going to learn together. Okay, Hologram Cloud ADR. So it seems like a Chinese company's implied volatility is a little bit higher. Let's see what this question mark is right here. They had earnings on November 20, or excuse me, September 23rd. So it doesn't look like earnings are too big of a threat. Uh, but it has this base right around four, interestingly enough. And unfortunately, the options are at a five strike. So I don't know if that's something I'd feel terribly confident about. It, you know, if you sold a five strike put for 30 cents a premium, your break even price would be 470. And there's definitely some precedent for this stock dropping below that. Uh, in addition, it looks like it's a Chinese company, which I'm not a huge fan of holding those. If we go to fundamentals, go to WIMI. Let's see, there you go. They're based in Beijing and they provide holographic AR advertising services and entertainment products. 
So interesting sounding company, but again, not one where I'm able to find a break-even price that, I, that I'm happy with that lines up with support. Let's move a little bit further down. There aren't the greatest names on here so far this week. CZOO, that one just sounds crazy. Let's take a look at it. CZOO, Kazoo Group. Now, you can see that already on the 20-day chart that we have right here, this thing's coming up from 7 bucks a share. So let's zoom out. Let's look to the left and see where it's... Okay, so this is 100% formerly a SPAC. And how do we know that? The answer is because there's this price floor right around 10 bucks a share. Looks like they had their merger and it kind of dropped off the face of the earth because after they have the merger, that price floor is gone and the stock can do whatever it wants. Now, typically a lot of these that are below 10 bucks a share can kind of be a little bit of a deal. And we've seen a lot of these SPACs carry a decent amount of option premium that we've been able to sell. So it looks like seven was a little bit of a base while keeping in mind that it you know bottomed out at 6.2. Let's take a look and see if we can get anything down around that level. And honestly, we, we can't, right? Uh, I think moving forward, 7.5 for December has a little bit, but that's just not big enough of a return at 7.5 compared to where that stock has been. So I'm not not the biggest fan in the world on that one. And you know, the scan isn't always going to have great results, right? We have 971 different options on here, so I'm not going to bore you guys to tears. We're going to move to a different strategy other than the high premium puts uh, if we can't find any more in the next couple that we look at. But there we go. We've got a question from Ishin. Welcome to the stream. They're new here. Thoughts on EVGO? Let's take a look at it. Thank you for tuning in with us tonight. EVGO, Evolution Gaming. And you know, this is exactly the type of setup that brings stocks to the forefront of attention, forefront of discussion, right? This thing was trading at about eight bucks a share through the beginning of October. And then all of a sudden at the end of October started shooting up and now finds itself more than twice as high as that. And, you know, really not a lot of premium where we would want it, right? We could see areas of support at eight. We see areas of support at 11, maybe an area of support here at 1458. And if we look at 1458, you know, that'd be between 14 and 15, less than 1% of return on those options. And for how volatile this thing could be, there's, you know, no reason it can't fall right back down and screw you if you're sitting there with that basis of 15 or 14 bucks a share. So, you know, interesting looking one because these setups, these big jumps cause excitement. It brings stocks like this to the forefront of discussion, but in the context of our option selling strategy, really not what we're going for unless this is, you know, a stock that you're really confident in, you love the stock and you'd be happy to hold it long term. Selling a cash secured put at a price that you'd be happy to have it at, as always, is a, is a good idea. I just don't know a ton about this one. It looks like it's been pretty volatile. And we see setups like this a lot, and they don't typically end well. And that's not to say this thing can't go up in the long run, but I think in the short run, especially if we pull up our favorite little study under the chart right here for RSI, if I can, I feel like I always have so much trouble navigating. There we go. Boom. RSI, you can see it's getting into overbought territory, which is anywhere 70 or above, which is when it turns red. Uh, granted, it did level out a little bit, and if we zoom in on maybe the 20-day, we can see it started to crest a little bit. But, uh, you know, just way too much downside in the immediate future. So I'm probably going to leave that one alone for now. Uh, back to the scam. We'll take a look at one more before we switch gears and maybe start looking at some earnings type trades. Uh, SOS could be interesting, right? This is another crypto miner that I feel like we have pop up a lot in here. But SOS, I know I said I was going to stay away from the miners. But sometimes, you know, the big drops, this, you know, the volatility that you see from these things, especially if we zoom out and look at this in the context of 180 days, this looks like a decent price to get in at. While this, you know, probably does look like it's on a one-way trip to zero, but uh, this looks like it could potentially be an area of support. And we have a question from Ishan asking about buying puts. Uh, since I guess this is your first time tuning in, all we do is sell puts and sell options. We don't recommend buying. If you did want to play, uh, you know, EVGO back down using a call credit spread, probably would be your best bet. So, uh, you know, we typically don't try to buy puts because you have to be right about a bunch of things, right? You have to be right about the direction. You have to be right about the magnitude of the move in that direction. And three, you have to be right about the timing of the magnitude of the move in that direction. And all those things going together, you know, make it a really risky game to play. How do you know when to sell? How do you know when to hold? The answer is, you know, you really don't. And with these uh, 
with the option selling trades, we put ourselves in defined risk, defined gain type trades, and it becomes a lot easier to enter, to exit, and know how long to hold on to things and give yourself a decent cushion. So that's why we take the approach that we do as opposed to option buying. All right, excuse me. So going back to SOS, you know, it looks like for November 19th, and this one's interesting because they don't just have the monthlies, right? They've got weeklies. So if the 1.5 didn't work for you, you would be able to uh, to get in and sell potentially some covered calls for the week after, the week after, the week after. They've got 50 cent intervals. It was a Chinese miner. Sierra, what happened? Do tell. I, I knew it was a Chinese miner, but uh, I didn't know. Did something happen to it that made it not a Chinese miner? Let's see. Let's take a look at the news feed. SOS shares halted news pending and they announced a direct offering so that is why the uh that is why the stock dropped right they announced an offering of 51.5 million basically shares at a dollar 75 and this is some interesting news right because when you have an offering basically they sold a bunch of shares to people at this price right here so now we know we have a bunch of investors at 175 and theoretically in the short term it's going to dilute the stock that's why the stock dropped it's never good news when a company has an offering for the stock price. But if you can get in after the offering, taking advantage of the volatility here, I don't hate potentially getting in on some of these 1.5 strike puts, right? It's not the greatest company in the world, but sometimes the numbers, they just work, right? If we sell a 1.5 strike put for eight cents a piece, that's gonna put us at a 142 break even price. That sits us right there. But most importantly, if it stays above a buck 50 for the upcoming week, we're getting a 5.26% return on capital at risk. Yeah, they do have to be fully cash secured. That's not surprising because it is a little bit risky. But this is definitely a decent return for the amount of risk that I think you're putting into play. And, you know, the caveat here is it's definitely risky. That's why the premium's there. It's a $1.50 Chinese mining stock. But from an option selling perspective, it would have to make a decently large move in the next five days uh, for you to lose money on that with that 142, 143 break even price. Uh, especially considering the fact that they just sold a bunch of these for a dollar seventy-five a piece, so those people are going to be aiming to get their money back. I doubt we see it drop too much in the near term. So I like the way that one sets up. Moving further down the list here, let's see what we've got. Anything else that pops out or looks interesting? Uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. Maybe A R V L. I've never heard of that one. That could be the last one we look at really quickly. We've got the question, what is a spread? And that is when you buy an option and sell an option at the same time to create you know, a directional type trade. We've got videos on our YouTube channel explaining how credit spreads work if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, now, this is interesting. Let's see, is this another? It is not another SPAC as far as I can tell. Let's go to the three year to confirm that. And there you go, I'm wrong. This definitely was a SPAC. And this is why we try a good visual example of why we tried to avoid setups that look like this because when they look like this, people are going to be talking about it. It's really exciting. I'm sure there are people out there who made a lot of money on the run-up. But eventually, all these run-ups kind of fall back down. Now, we know 10 is the former price floor. If we go back to that three-year chart, former price floor, we know after the merger that the price floor isn't really a thing anymore. However, there typically is at least a little bit of resistance there. And we did see that exhibited back in August as it bounced off of 10 the first time. And off this big red candle, there's some decent opportunity for option premium in the coming weeks and it looks like that opportunity is kind of restricted around this 12.5 or 13 area we've identified 10 as the price floor there really isn't any premium down around 10 uh, so for that reason i'm not a huge fan of getting in on this trade so you know the high return on risk put weekend scan was not a huge uh was not incredibly exciting or anything like that but let's go to another scan we've got and see if we can find some more things coming up in here right we're going to go to High return on risk puts with earnings. So let's pop that in there. Let's run the scan and let's see what we've got for the upcoming week. And this is one where we're going to see a lot more premium on hopefully the idea is, you know, some some stronger names. Right. And I'm not seeing anything too familiar here for the upcoming week. But let's uh, I think the easier way to isolate some of these earnings trades is going to be to pop over to our discord server really quickly. If I pull this back up. Hope you all are enjoying watching this gray loading screen. Come on. 
Here we go. Here we go. We've got we've got a mention in earnings. Let's see what the people are saying. Talking about Tesla. But here we go. So for the upcoming week, we've got Lucid on Monday after close. We've got Walmart, Home Depot, some better names, NVIDIA, uh, Macy's, they report, Petco. Okay, okay. We've, we've got some names that are coming up here. Let's take a look at how some of these are looking. Lucid, you know, off the bat, I don't like this company. They haven't really sold any cars, and they have an insane uh, – stock valuation right we, we talk so much about these specs that had this 10 dollar price floor go up and then fall back down guess what it's going back up again and until they actually have some concrete revenue to back up what they're doing as a company i think fundamentally in the long run the numbers are going to win out and we're going to see this fall back down so something i definitely would not want to initiate a bullish position on but you know with how irrationally the stock has acted and how heavily shorted it is and how crazy some of the price action we've seen over the last 180 days is it's not necessarily one that I would want to play back down either, right? And, you know, we could spend so much time analyzing a stock and stare at something for so long that we make ourselves feel like we need to make a trade on something. We need to have an opinion. It's okay to step away from something like this where we don't want to play it up because we think it's overvalued, but similarly don't want to play it back down because, you know, the upward moves in here have just defied logic. So I clearly don't understand Lucid at this point. So I think it's best for me to just stay away from this one. You know, it's so much better to miss out on a good trade than be stuck in a bad trade. And I think this is a prime candidate to find yourself stuck in a bad trade as an option seller. So moving away from that one, Walmart reports before open on Tuesday. We could take a look at the Walmart chart. Okay, there you have it. Some, you know, a little bit of volatility over the last 180 days. We go to the trade tab. We've got a $5.55 implied, not implied move, but market maker move. And the implied move right here is $6.08. So not a huge difference between those, about 50 cents lower than the implied move. And again, that market maker move is a proprietary formula from Thinkorswim that, you know, TD Ameritrade claims that the market makers use to calculate what you can expect a stock to move in the upcoming week. So theoretically, it's more accurate than the implied move, which is the move of the stock implied by the implied volatility, as the name suggests, on the option chain, and that's $6.08. So when this number is significantly lower than this number, when the market maker move is significantly lower than the move from the implied volatility, uh, there's some really big opportunity for option sellers. But we don't see too big of a gap here, so we can kind of ignore that and take a look at what we see on both ends of this, right? So it's trading at about 147-ish, so it could be about a 142 to 152-ish range, so that's about here to here. And what you can see is this is actually really interesting. When we look at the upper end of this range, a lot of uh, a lot of the time, first off, the market maker move is relatively consistent and does a great job of predicting where a stock will move. Uh, and additionally, one of the best things, I, I guess one of the best areas of technical analysis, because I don't like to do a lot of technical analysis, but I do think support and resistance are two of the best parts or two of the best methods of technical analysis and they play out pretty accurately and we can see that happening here right it topped out at 152 57 the next time it went up near there it bounced right back down so this is an area that we can consider resistance and additionally this lines up with the upper end of the expected move so if there's anything that i would want to do with walmart i think it would be a bearish trade right to keep it below 152.50 so if we switch our spread to vertical Go over here to keep it below 152.50. We could do that with this spread right here. And we could put ourselves in a position where the payoff's about 25% of what we're risking. I'm not the biggest fan of that risk versus the reward there because we, we've seen some pretty big earnings moves this time of year. If we back out, you know, this is the last earnings they had. Nothing too severe. They really haven't had any crazy earnings moves, earning moves over the historical period. And a great way to see that is to go to the Analyze tab, go to Earnings. And type WMT back in there. And a couple of questions. We've got Ishin again asking, how much money have we made since we started trading? Since we've started trading and publicly tracking what we do in here for option selling, we have made, there you go, $142,607. We've got that all publicly tracked. You know, you could look at our HT trades channels. Those are all time stamped. So you could verify that we are not just making that up. Uh, next question we had was from Will F on YouTube saying, how about RMO? Four strike puts, it's near the 52-week low. Uh, they also love SOS, been trading it for months. So I do like the uh, the 1.5 strike on SOS. Oh, it's Will Stock. What's going on? 
Uh, let's take a look at RMO really quickly. But again, Walmart, if I want to play it, I think I'd play it back down below 152.50. But again, I'm not in love with potentially making a bearish trade on Walmart right here. So, you know, another one I'm not in love one way or the other. No need to force myself into a trade. How about RMO? It's getting back down near four. It's at 453 is what uh is what it closed out on Friday. So what can we get on a weekly basis right here? Let's switch our spread back to single. Four strike puts are offering some premium. What's going on here? Do they have earnings coming up? They've got to, right? They have to. There you go. Earnings on 11.15 after market central time. So there you have it. Uh, so that's why the four strike puts have some very, very solid premium. I don't know too much about what we could potentially see for the earnings. But one thing about RMO is it's one of those examples of a SPAC gone bad, right? You've got this $10 price floor, ran up to almost 40 bucks a share, fell all the way back down. It is now chilling at uh, at 4.53 a share right there. So, I mean, you know, getting in at 4, a 3.23% return in a week is always solid. I will never tell you to... Uh, to stray away from something like that and i think you can get a little bit of help on the margin department right there there you go so you can get almost you know a 100 dollars return off of 1300 dollars of collateral right there that's a little under 10 percent roc which is a really really solid number and i guess you know these things have weekly options at decent intervals they got 50 cent intervals so i don't think rmo would be a bad one uh, to take a flyer on for earnings and additionally we could use that concept of the market maker move where it's 65 cents as compared to 73 cents uh, from implied volatility so 65 cents down from here is at about, you know, 390 ish. And that would pretty much put you right where the basis of the four strike put would at 390. So you got a couple things working for you right there. And honestly, I, I like the trade. I like the idea of getting it on RMO for earnings. But again, that's on the 15th. That's tomorrow. Wow, the month is flying by. After market. So we'd have to get it on those tomorrow afternoon. And again, when I open trades for earnings, what I want to be cautious of is price action between right now and earnings. So if a company is announcing Wednesday afternoon, I can look at a trade, have a trade on my radar right now, but I'm not going to want to open it until you know Wednesday afternoon right before they make that announcement. Because this, sometimes the price action in the meantime could put you in a situation where all of a sudden your cushion is completely gone before the company has even announced the earnings. And the whole reason we're selling options for earnings is to give ourselves that massive cushion and try to benefit from that. So that's where we're at right there. Let's see. We got another comment about Ride. 11.26, 4.5 strike puts. Ride is not the greatest stock in the world because, uh, you know, I think they had some cash flow issues, potential bankruptcy, right? And a lot of the time we can manage our basis on a week-to-week -week basis pretty, pretty well. The only thing that could really screw us is if a stock quite literally goes to zero. And bankruptcy is a great way to, uh, great way to do that. Looks like it was down 17%. On Friday, good lord, that is a massive, massive, massive move back down. But it looks like that's only because there's a little bit of volatility, relatively steady over the last five days around this 555 area, back it up to the 20 day chart, 464 low right there. But let's see, 4.5 strike puts is what you were looking at for 1126. Uh, you know, not uh, first off, anytime a stock has weekly options, you should take the weekly option before you go to you know two weeks out for this one. I would say that might be a small exception because, you know, the weekly ones are only offering two or three cents, whereas you can get seven to nine going a couple weeks out. But again, golden rule of selling options is don't sell up or just only sell puts on stocks you'd be comfortable owning at strikes you would be comfortable owning them at. And that just doesn't follow that one for me. Uh, we got a question again about BRPM. BRPM is one that we've been holding on to. We got a video about it. You know, it's another SPAC to continue the theme of having $10 price floors. So from this price of 1039 right now, there's not a whole lot of potential downside in the uh, in the near future. And we could see some sort of upside like this anytime between now and when they have their merger in Q1 of 2022. So we've got a good month or two to be sitting back and waiting on that. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. We'll cut the trade loose before the merger. We'll call it a loss. But, uh, you know, I always like the idea of these low risk, high reward type trades and trades and uh, BRPM definitely fits the bill on that one. So going back, taking a look, I keep clicking the wrong Google Chrome window. Here we go. Uh, NVIDIA is one that's coming up. And I think some of these later on in the week will probably be better analyzed in our Discord server in this very earnings plays channel. 
uh, because you know a lot can happen price wise between now and uh, Wednesday or now and Thursday. So looking at them right now is kind of pointless. But Lucid and Walmart are a couple of those that are coming up. But uh, you know, all in all, at a high level, I like what we have coming into this week, right? And having flexibility is the single most important thing that we could have headed into a week. And I want to keep some buying power free to give myself that kind of flexibility because we have so many different trades that are expiring this Friday, November 19th, that if any of these move against us, we want to be able to use some of the strategies that we've talked about on the stream tonight to be able to manage that basis and manage our break even price. And if a trade's a winner, we'll take the money off the table. But again, if some of these trades turn into losers, we want to have some cash on the hand because that cash on hand affords us flexibilities to... Uh, affords us flexibility to manage those positions. We have a question about Disney on the earnings drop. And that's a good question because this kind of fits into the mold of what we did with Beyond, what we did with Zillow. And there was actually a decent discussion about this that we had in our premium section of the chat. And I think I could pull it up really quickly to show you what kind of things I am looking for. Oops, where can I find it? Where can I find it? I think 164 is what I had in the message that I sent initially. There you go. So initially what we did, right? Uh, we were thinking about potentially making the same type of earnings trade. This is what that chart looked like. It dropped from 174 down to 166. However, when you look at that 166 level, it comes in right around here. To use that idea of support and resistance from a TA perspective, you know, support doesn't seem to be until about 144 to 150. And with the stock at 166, with no support below it, and it's kind of hanging out in this gap that we see right here between uh, July and uh, the end of the year. And wait, January, July. That's right. In the back end of 2020, you know, it, there's no good idea of where it could potentially settle. Whereas with something like a Zillow, if we pull up Zillow's charter, like a Beyond, if we zoom back out to like the three year, off this big red earnings drop that they had right here, you know, it traded relatively flat in 2019 at around the 76 range. We have a perceived area of support. With the Disney chart, when it was trading at 166, there was no perceived area of support. And that's exactly what we called out pretty much live in our Discord server, right? It's tough to say where it's going to settle. 164 is no man's land. So there's definitely room for it to keep bleeding out. And we said all this when Disney was at 166. If we take a look at... Uh, if we take a look at the chart, it is kept dropping from 166. So that analysis that we had as far as support, areas of resistance, support, where things are going to keep falling after earnings was pretty much spot on, right? It, it bottomed out at 158.53. So we maybe have a little bit more confidence now about where this thing is ultimately going to settle. Uh, but until it gets to this 154-ish range, I mean, it's it's really tough to say, I think where this thing could eventually settle. Uh, I like, let's see, the peak right here back in 2019 is about 154. You see that again before the big green candle is where that took off from. So 154, I think, isn't a bad spot to get in on. But the question now is, you know, when can you get premium in that 155-ish area? And right now, it's only offering 0.38% per week on that. So that I don't know if that's necessarily something that I would want to... Uh, I'd want to be in. So Disney, I think it's, you know, one of those companies, it's a blue chip type company where I'd be happy to own it and have it in my portfolio. But as of right now, still kind of in that no man's land. And if it gets back down to the 150-ish level, I'd be happy to get a little, bit, a little bit more aggressive and sell some cash secured puts on it that are kind of near the money. But again, high level recap of what we've got going on right now. This is it right here. I think everything with the exception of XCLA and uh, CBAT are pretty good for entry Monday morning if you're not already in on any of these trades. We are going to let these play out. But again, as always, so much happens on a day-to-day -day basis in the market. Implied volatility moves all over the place. Option premium moves all over the place. So we're going to be keeping an eye on that. Definitely adding to this list of trades that we have right here based off the opportunity that we see this week. And we're going to be alerting all of that in our Discord server and our HT Trades channel right here where we alert every single entry and every single exit that we make and you can join that by going to the link at hourglass-trader.com but we've hit the hour mark and i think that's a pretty good recap of where what we did last week what we've got for the upcoming week we took a look at a couple names that were on the scanner a couple earnings opportunities but honestly nothing really jumped off the page the moral of the story there is we don't need to force ourselves into any trades because as we know on a day-to-day -day basis i mean there have been so many times where i've told myself hey you know i'm done for the day i'm not going to trade and then an hour later i enter into something because 
you know, a new opportunity came up. So there's only so much we could do on Sunday nights. And, you know, I feel like I say this every week to kind of temper expectations about what kind of plan we want to have coming into the week. But, you know, rest assured, there will be opportunity somewhere in the market this week. I don't know where it's going to be, but when we see it, we will be sure to talk about it. We'll share it. We'll let you know. And most importantly, we will alert any entries that we make in that Discord server. So for those of you who have joined us for the stream tonight, thank you so much. If it was your first time, welcome. Hope we see you again next week. And if you've seen us before, thanks for tuning back in. But the one little piece of superstition I think that we have at the end of these streams is when I use my corny little sign-off that I came up with. There was one week in the past two months where I did not use the corny sign-off, and it was this week right here, and we lost 3500 bucks. So I think our performance in the market, you know, we could do all of this analysis, but it may be more directly correlated to how I sign off from the stream. So we're going to do that right now by saying, thank you for watching. This has been the Hourglass Trader, where as time passes, we make money, and hopefully we see you guys again next week, 